Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. William Davis, author of the Wheat Belly series of books, as well as Undoctored and most recently, Supergut. Well, I've gotten involved in a project in which we conducted a small human clinical trial where we made some unexpected findings relevant to this question of the shape of your body and its body composition. So I'd like to take you on a little journey to thinking about getting away from the idea of weight loss and thinking about something that I think is a better idea, and that is body shape and body composition. So I call this new science of shape and body composition. And I think you'd be surprised by some of these findings, but let's go over a few issues first. So you already know that being overweight or being obese is physically crippling sometimes and socially crippling. They're often afraid to go into social situations. They're often embarrassed or demoralized because of the struggles they've had. And of course, that excess weight has health consequences, sometimes very serious health consequences, can even abbreviate your life by up to a decade. And now, more recently, we've had the appearance of something called ectopic fat. And that is, people, your body has run out of places to store excess fat, so it starts to store in various organs. It could be in the liver, fatty liver. It could be in the kidneys, which damages the kidneys and uh, deteriorates kidney function. It could be in the pancreas where fat in the pancreas damages the pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin. And this fat can actually convert a type 2 diabetic to a type 1 diabetic, insulin-dependent diabetic. Fat can accumulate around the heart, so-called epicardial fat. And that inflames the heart's arteries, the coronary arteries, and accelerates the development of atherosclerosis and takes you closer to such things as heart attacks and sudden cardiac death. You can even get fat accumulating in the joints, like knees and hips, where that kind of fat accelerates the deterioration of cartilage and thereby brings you closer and closer to bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. So these have become very serious issues, all due to the accumulation of fat in places where it doesn't belong. Now, the problem is that conventional efforts to lose weight are deeply flawed. They're plagued by some very serious problems. We're going to talk about how conventional methods to lose weight preferentially cause loss of subcutaneous fat, fat below the skin, not the most problematic kind of fat, which is the fat in your abdomen, so-called abdominal visceral fat. We'll talk about how it's tricky, it's tough, tracking the most problematic form of fat, abdominal visceral fat. We'll talk about how conventional methods of weight, of losing weight, lead to inevitably loss of muscle, and that reduces your basal metabolic rate, the rate at which you burn calories, and it virtually guarantees, conventional methods of losing weight virtually guarantee weight regain. And some of these methods are very costly, especially pharmaceuticals and bariatric procedures. So let's talk about the most problematic form of fat, fat within the abdominal cavity. That is fat that surrounds abdominal organs, like the colon, small intestine, liver, and pancreas. Because that fat, unlike subcutaneous fat just below the skin, Abdominal visceral fat is responsible for the process of insulin resistance. So what that means is your body's organs, liver, muscle, uh, brain, don't respond to insulin. So your pancreas overcompensates by producing huge amounts of insulin, tenfold more, 30-fold more, even 100-fold more. And those high levels of insulin cause the accumulation, the growth of abdominal visceral fat. So abdominal visceral fat causes insulin resistance. Insulin resistance feeds back on abdominal visceral fat, making it worse. So it's a vicious cycle once it gets underway. And it's worsened by the release of inflammatory mediators, inflammatory cytokines by that abdominal visceral fat. So abdominal visceral fat, responsible for insulin resistance and inflammation, causing itself to grow even larger, even more fat. So it's a vicious cycle we need to stop if you want to gain control over weight as well as shape and body composition. Here are two CT scans of two different people. Both have BMIs of 24, body mass indexes. Recall that mo in most conventional circles, a BMI of 25 or less is considered normal or ideal. A BMI of 30 or greater considered obese. Well, both these people fall in the favorable range. The person on the right, you can see in purple, has a little bit of subcutaneous fat and has a little bit of visceral fat in yellow. The person on the left, same BMI, has a lot more subcutaneous fat, but more importantly, has tons of visceral fat, abdominal visceral fat. And also, look at the muscle mass in the back muscles and in the abdominal muscles. 
the person on the left has far less muscle. So the person on the left, despite having the same BMI as the person on the right, is far less metabolically healthy, much more abdominal visceral fat, much less muscle. So the person on the left is likely to have greater insulin resistance, greater inflammation, higher triglycerides, higher blood pressure, higher C-reactive protein, all the metabolic distortions that come from having excess abdominal visceral fat. So the conventional weight loss solutions, such as reducing calories, we could call it move more, eat less, push the plate away, or some branded program, but they're all variations on reducing calories. The so-called GLP-1 agonist drugs like Wegovy and Ozempic, those drugs also cause you to reduce calories. And bariatric procedures, likewise, gastric bypass or lap band, all reduce calorie intake. So whether it's calorie reduction, or a pharmaceutical or bariatric procedure, they're all variations on the same theme. They all involve a reduction in calories. GLP-1 agonists reduce your appetite. Bariatric procedures reduce the volume of your stomach. And when you do that, when you reduce calories, regardless of the method, there's preferential loss of subcutaneous fat, fat below the skin, not abdominal visceral fat. So you don't get the full benefit of losing weight when you follow the conventional path of reducing calories. Here's a large analysis of all the studies done looking at, the, at this question. That is how much subcutaneous versus abdominal visceral fat do you lose? So this is diet and exercise. You can see the numbers with subcutaneous fat are much larger than they are for visceral fat. Likewise with drugs, there's more subcutaneous fat loss than abdominal visceral fat. Bariatric procedures, a lot more subcutaneous fat than abdominal visceral fat. And so if you don't lose not much abdominal visceral fat and lose mostly subcutaneous fat, you don't obtain full benefit on undoing insulin resistance and inflammation. Another problem with conventional weight loss solutions is that there is inevitable loss of muscle. Almost all methods of weight loss that involve reduction in calorie involves about 25% of the weight loss is muscle. Now, you can spare, they can blunt that effect a little by taking a higher protein intake, but in general, most methods to lose weight, calorie reduction, pharmaceuticals, and bariatric procedures involve loss of, of muscle. Here's a study where super obese people were enrolled. These are people with BMIs of 50 or greater, and remarkably put on a program, low calories, and two hours per day of a combination of aerobic and resistance training six days a week. It's a huge <laughs> amount of exercise, right? 12 hours a week of intense exercise. They were very successful losing weight. Of the weight they lost though, 10 kilograms or about 22 pounds was muscle, which guarantees that their metabolic rate drops. In this study, these people had a marked reduction in the rate at which they burn calories. Basal metabolic rate is the rate at which your body burns calories for the work of living, like breathing and digesting food and replacing proteins and various organs. So your body's burning this low grade amount of energy. Well, when you lose muscle, your basal metabolic rate drops. And in this study, it persisted for six years, probably went longer than six years, but the study ended at six years. So at least six years, there's a marked reduction, in this case, 27% in basal metabolic rate, which means that even if you maintain a low calorie intake, you will regain the weight. That's how you booby trap a program by cutting calories regardless of the method. So let's look at this woman. Let's say she wants to lose weight. So she's got a choice, right? Reduce calorie diet, one of those injectable drugs or a bariatric procedure, say she loses 40 pounds. Of that 40 pounds, 10, per 10 pounds is muscle, a lot of muscle. Well, that means her basal metabolic rate has dropped significantly. Even if she stays in a low calorie diet, she regains all the weight because she made the mistake of reducing calories and thereby losing muscle. And it may have cost her $15,000 for that year's worth of that injectable drug, for instance. So a lot of money spent and it all comes back. Here's a study in which the drug semaglutide, that's WeGoV and it was Empic, was given over a year and a half and there was marked weight loss. Then the drug was stopped. Most people can't afford to take these drugs forever, right? They're a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a month. So a person has a choice, they stay on the drug forever, a great cost, 
and exposure side effects beyond nausea and vomiting. There's also potential for bowel obstruction and pancreatitis, which is very dangerous, a very bad outcome. So they stop it after a year and a half in this case, and they regain most of the weight. So if they lost 40 pounds, they typically regain about 32 to 34 pounds, which is nearly all fat, very little muscle. When that happens, insulin resistance is worse. The risk for prediabetes and type 2 diabetes is greater. Blood pressure tends to be higher. Triglyceride levels are higher, thereby risk for heart disease. Increased fatty liver, increased cardiovascular risk, increased potential for cognitive impairment and dementia, increased risk for breast cancer. In other words, you're worse off than you were at the beginning if you reduce calories, including with use of a GLP-1 agonist. Can you measure abdominal visceral fat? Well, you, you now appreciate BMI is not that helpful, right? Remember those two cross-sectional CT scans? One person had a lot of abdominal visceral fat. The other person did, did not have much at all at the same BMI and pretty much the same waist circumference. So BMI, not very helpful. It, can't, it also can't distinguish between fat and muscle. Calipers, like they use in gyms to measure the thickness of your skin, is useless. That's a reflection of subcutaneous fat at best and certainly not abdominal visceral fat. Waist circumference can be helpful. It doesn't tell you how much of that waist circumference is subcutaneous and how much is abdominal visceral fat, but it's something you can track for change over time. Waist tip ratio also not very helpful for similar reasons. There are body scales that use a method called bioimpedance. There are three I'm aware of, the in-body device in some doctor's offices and the home scales, Tanita and Withings that do calculate abdominal visceral fat. They're not real accurate, but they're more useful for tracking if you're trying to reduce your abdominal visceral fat. DEXA is the one of the gold standards, uh, often done for bone density, of course, but you can also get a visceral fat calculation that you can track. CT, cross-sectional CT and MRI at the lumbar spine level is the gold standard, but of course, CT is involves radiation and uh, injection of a contrast agent, MRI, also a contrast agent. And these are very expensive, so not routinely done, mostly in research. But should you have occasion, that is a way you could see how much abdominal visceral fat you have versus subcutaneous fat. The best way to approach this is to choose a measure, the two best waist circumference or a bioimpedance scale with a visceral fat calculation and correlate it with markers that become abnormal when you have too much abdominal visceral fat. The best is triglycerides. So the higher your triglycerides, I would regard an ideal triglyceride level of 60 milligrams per deciliter or less. So if yours are 190, you know you've got a lot of abdominal visceral fat and you're going to work on that and track it. HDL cholesterol, the lower it is, the more abdominal visceral fat. Small LDL, the higher it is, the more abdominal visceral fat. Likewise, glucose and insulin, fasting glucose and insulin. You want those to be minimal. You want fasting glucose to be between 70 and 90 milligrams per deciliter. And you want insulin to be low single digits, like no more than four micro units. When it's, if it's high, think about too much abdominal visceral fat. Likewise, blood pressure, you want it low. You want it like 102, 110, over 70, something like that. High blood pressures, one of the major contributors, abdominal visceral fat. And likewise, C-reactive protein, measure of inflammation, and uric acid. So you can track these numbers to give you an index of how much abdominal visceral fat you have. Now, can we preferentially target the loss of abdominal visceral fat while preserving or even increasing muscle? Because if we do so, the health benefits are likely to be greater, greater drops in glucose, greater reduction in insulin resistance, and reduction in inflammation. We're going to preserve or increase lean muscle mass and thereby preserve basal metabolic rate. Weight loss is faster because you're addressing insulin resistance and inflammation, and you prevent the regain, the awful demoralizing weight regain from loss of muscle. So we've devised a way to circumvent all the problems associated with conventional weight loss solutions. They're not solutions, right? So we start by never cutting calories. That is long-term. You can cut calories for a brief period without adverse effects. But when you reduce calories for more than a few days, you start to accumulate problems like loss of muscle. And so we never cut calories. We do reduce or eliminate the foods that cause a rise in blood glucose and insulin. 
wheat grains and sugars. We address common nutrient deficiencies that when deficient add to insulin resistance and inflammation. So magnesium, vitamin D, iodine, and omega-3 fatty acids, those four put together synergize to minimize insulin resistance and inflammation and thereby help you release abdominal visceral fat and ectopic fat. Sleep, of course, major player in determining your level of insulin resistance and inflammation. So adequate sleep is important. Let's add some additional pieces that accelerate this process, amplify it, and give you these advantages of specifically targeting abdominal visceral fat and thereby insulin resistance and inflammation and preserve or increase lean muscle mass. So we're going to address dysbiosis, disrupted microbial composition in the colon. We're going to address small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, and endotoxemia that accompanies SIBO. We'll talk about that. We're going to do so by restoring a microbe lost by nearly everyone, lactobacillus rotori, and we do so at high doses. We're going to replace two things absent or lacking in the modern diet, collagen peptides and hyaluronic acid, because we were told to cut our fat and cut our saturated fat, even though there never was evidence to support that. But people listened and then thereby abandoned consumption of organ meats like brain, tongue, and heart, and stomach, and intestines, and thereby failed to get collagen peptides and hyaluronic acid, both of which are major influences on your body shape and body composition. Lastly, we boost your intake of carotenoids. It could have been beta carotene. It could have been lutein or zeaxanthin, but we chose astaxanthin as the most potent of all to compensate for the low carotenoid intake. And that alone also adds additional advantages in determining your shape and body composition. Let's focus on this micro. Lost by nearly everybody. Lost from the human gastrointestinal microbiome because it's very susceptible to common antibiotics. So we've nearly all lost lactobacillus rotori. This microbe that has five very important body composition modifying effects because rotori increase the release of oxytocin from the brain. We'll talk about each of these. Increased growth hormone, which has major influence on body composition. Increased testosterone in males, major determinant of body shape and composition. We're going to reduce something called lipopolysaccharide, endotoxemia, a major influence on body shape, insulin resistance. And we're going to reduce hedonic eating or snacking behavior. This is all accomplished by restoring this lost microbe, lactobacillus rotori. And when you do this, there is a restoration of youthful muscle cell volume. There is a reduction in insulin resistance and your ability to release fat. And there's a reduction in those inflammatory mediators, inflammatory cytokines, further adding to the reduction in insulin resistance. So lactobacillus rotori, we replace it because it's been lost, takes up residence in the GI tract and sends a, met, sends a signal via the vagus nerve up through the chest, neck to the brain to release oxytocin, the hormone oxytocin. And oxytocin has, although many people recognize oxytocin as the hormone of love and empathy, it's far more than that. In fact, I would call oxytocin as the master hormonal controller of your body shape and body composition. In experimental animals, if you get that animal rotori, lactobacillus rotori, there is over a 300% increase in oxytocin. By the way, if we compare these mice to humans, the left Bar, black bar is what we look like. We tend to have levels of about 500 picograms in uh, oxytocin because we don't have rotori. On the right, the white bar, very much higher, th over 300% higher. That's what you see in hunter-gatherer humans who are, had not been exposed to antibiotics or glyphosate or herbicides and pesticides or stomach acid blocking drugs and all those kinds of factors that uh, decimate the human microbiome, including rotori. So they have levels of oxytocin in their blood of 1,500, 1,700, about threefold higher, just like these mice. This is what happens to muscle. This is, this is an old mouse on the left lower panel, an old mouse whose muscles was cut and cross-sectioned and stained. You can see this muscle cells are small and atrophied. Another old mouse given oxytocin, you can see the muscle cells rebound and they are indistinguishable from a young mouse, big plump muscle cells, just like a young mouse. Another study, animals given lactobacillus rotori, there is a doubling of myocyte or muscle cell size. So dramatic restoration of muscle. 
not loss of muscle, restoration of muscle, increase in muscle, increase muscle cell size, increase in overall muscle mass in the body. Now, lactobacillus roteri is interesting for other reasons. It colonized the GI tract, including the 24 feet of small intestine, which is very unusual. Most microbes don't do that. Most microbes in the gastrointestinal tract colonize the colon, the large bowel. But roteri has the ability to colonize the colon, yes, but also the 24 feet of small intestine, where it takes up residence and produces what are called bacteriocins. These are natural antibiotics effective against fecal microbes. Fecal microbes that have ascended to the small intestine is a very common condition that I believe afflicts about 150 million Americans. That is one in two Americans. Now, when that happens, when you have fecal microbes in the small intestine, that's a very bad situation because the small intestine is not equipped to deal with fecal microbes like E. coli or salmonella. Well, those microbes, trillions of them, have ascended into the small intestine because we've lost so many healthy species that used to suppress them. Now we have trillions of fecal microbes in the small intestine. The small intestine is by design very permeable because that's where you're supposed to absorb amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. But when fecal microbes come to inhabit the 24 feet of small intestine, they live and die very rapidly. They only live for a few hours at a time. When they die, they release some of their toxins, especially one called lipopolysaccharide or LPS endotoxin. And because the small intestine is permeable, that LPS endotoxin enters the bloodstream. And that's called endotoxemia. Endotoxemia is a major driver of insulin resistance and inflammation, adding to weight gain. So what happens when you correct this situation, when you restore roteri to the small intestine, there's a reduction in endotoxemia and thereby a reduction in insulin resistance, a reduction in inflammation, allowing you to release fat from abdominal visceral fat. There's a decrease in blood sugar, decrease in insulin, decrease in blood pressure, decrease in triglycerides, decrease in fatty liver. There's a decrease in abdominal visceral fat. There's an increase in lean muscle mass because when you have less insulin resistance, less inflammation, muscle is allowed to rebound. There's a decrease in skin inflammation and the severity of rashes. Now, let's go on further. So that's lactobacillus roteri and all its advantages exerted via two methods, boosting oxytocin and colonizing small bowel to reduce SIBO and endotoxemia. Let's now add those non-microbial factors lacking in the modern lifestyle, collagen peptides, hyaluronic acid, and the carotenoid astaxanthin that you're supposed to get from diet, but likely are not. Uh, I chose to use marine sourced collagen peptides because there are many forms of collagen. You can get it from bovine, cow, porcine, pig, chicken, and some other sources. But when you source it from marine creatures, there's all different kinds of fish, right? There's bony fish, there's cartilaginous fish. Some commercial makers use the scales as well as the bones or cartilage. But I chose marine sourced collagen peptides because of the evidence that suggests that this kind of collagen is enriched in what's called dye and tripeptides. So for many years, people didn't were skeptical that collagen peptides had any kind of effect different, say, from eating an egg or a pork chop. Because when your body, when you consume a protein, your digestive system breaks those proteins down into single amino acids. So people ask, why would collagen be any different? Well, it is different. It has two and three amino acid long peptides, dye and tripeptides that resist digestion and get to the various organs intact and stimulate very interesting effects, like stimulate fibroblast cells in the skin, in the dermal layer of skin to produce collagen, or chondroblasts in the collagen of your joints to produce components of cartilage. And it also has effects on body shape and body composition. It does so, marine source uh, dye and tripeptides at lower doses. So here is a study in older men with what's called sarcopenia, dramatic loss of muscle from aging and frailty. And they were given a mixture of different kinds of uh, collagen, 15 grams per day over 90 days, and three times a week engaged in resistance training, machines and weightlifting. And you can see on the left that there is an increase in lean muscle mass. The, the black bars of the men who got collagen, the gray bars of men who got placebo only exercise. And you can see with a uh, loss of fat mass, 
men who got the collagen lost more fat than the men who didn't get collagen. And then you can see increase in strength also. The men who got collagen had a 50% increase in strength. Placebo did have an increase in strength, but not as much. And you can see here also about a three and a half centimeter reduction in waist circumference just with collagen. So a reduction in waist circumference, fairly significant, right? Greater increased lean muscle mass, greater loss of fat. In this case, they didn't distinguish subcutaneous versus visceral fat, but loss of fat, increased strength, and marked reduction in waist circumference just from collagen peptides alone. In this case, a mixture of forms. Hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is a fiber. People don't think of it as a fiber. Most fibers come from plants, right? You get the galacto-oligosaccharides from legumes like white beans and black beans. You get the fructo-oligosaccharides from inulin that comes from onions, garlic, shallots, and root vegetables. So when you get hyaluronic acid that you should have gotten from consumption of skin, brain, and other organs, but most people don't do that anymore, it acts as a prebiotic fiber and it blooms numerous beneficial species. So don't remember this, but a very important species is Fecalobacterium presnitzii or Acromantia, mucinophila. Various bifidobacteria species, eubacteria species, lacnospiracea, ruminicacea. Uh, and those are all producers of the fatty acid butyrate. And getting hyaluronic acid also reduces fecal microbes, so-called proteobacteria, like E. coli and salmonella. Those are the species also of SIBO. Hyaluronic acid also increases the production of the protein in mucus, the mucin proteins, thereby strengthening the mucus barrier against microbes, protects your intestinal lining from microbes. And hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid also reduces that endotoxemia. So it helps lactobacillus roteri in reducing endotoxemia and thereby insulin resistance and inflammation. And there are hyaluronic acid taken orally, and by the way, not topically, but orally, reduces numerous inflammatory mediators. And a lot of this is because of the increase in butyrate production. Butyrate is a mediator of reduced insulin resistance, reduced blood pressure, reduced triglycerides, all those wonderful effects comes because hyaluronic acid nourished microbes that in turn made more butyrate. And this results in a reduction in waist circumference, an increase in species that produce butyrate, which is good for your long-term health, reduced insulin resistance, reduced fasting sugars, and reduction in the inflammatory mediators, once again, facilitating the release of abdominal visceral fat. Now, the last component, astaxanthin, a carotenoid, a relative of beta-carotene, lutein, zeaxanthin. But astaxanthin has been shown to increase, facilitate the mobilization of fatty acids. So that is the fatty acids stored in fat cells. So it causes your body to prefer to burn fat rather than glycogen from your liver. So it facilitates fat loss. And so you're less likely to pull from sugars in your liver and more likely to cause loss of fat from fat cells. It has major effects on your gastrointestinal microbiome. Once again, contributing to a reduction in those fecal microbes, proteobacteria, and reducing unhealthy microbes like biophila, the sulfovibrio, these are hydrogen sulfide producing microbes, not very good for you, and increases acromantia, a beneficial microbe that supports other healthy microbes and increases the integrity and strength of the mucus barrier. And astaxanthin has its own GLP-1 agonist effects. It's not a drug, right? It's just a carotenoid that's sourced from such things as salmon and shellfish. And it also causes an enhancement of physical performance, aerobic performance. So you're more likely to engage in such things as walking, biking, and other aerobic activities. So here's a study with astaxanthin. Look at the waist circumference. Once again, about a three centimeter reduction in waist circumference just with astaxanthin alone. Now we don't, this study didn't distinguish subcutaneous versus abdominal visceral, but there's at least some abdominal visceral fat loss just with the astaxanthin alone. Another study with astaxanthin, you can see there's a trend to reduction in visceral fat. And there's also improved measures reflecting a reduction in insulin resistance, reduction in systolic blood pressure, a reduction in blood triglycerides, dramatic reduction, and a reduction in a measure of blood sugar called fructosamine, and a rise in the beneficial hormone, adiponectin. In other words, astaxanthin by itself exerts positive effects on abdominal visceral fat and measures of insulin resistance, this carotenoid, from shellfish and salmon. We performed our own little clinical study. Now, this was done for skin purposes because 
uh, my audience loves the skin effects of lactobacillus rotari and these other things, loss of skin wrinkles, et cetera. But we also measured their waist circumference. So the blue or aqua bars are the waist circumference of these females, 25 ladies. Now we asked them, don't change your diet, please. Please don't, ex don't change your exercise program. Just take this formulation. And in orange is the reduction in waist circumference over 90 days. So the average loss was 7.2 centimeters or just short of three inches, as much as 21 centimeters or eight and a half inches. Now, even more interestingly, despite that dramatic loss of waist circumference up to eight or more inches, there was very little weight loss, only about a third of a pound. Well, how can you lose up to eight and a half inches off your waist circumference, but not lose weight? Well, consistent with the animal evidence, consistent with my large anecdotal experience, increased lean muscle mass. So 92% of the participants lost a lot off their waist circumference. Now, we need to perform further studies and, and using such methods as DEXA to see how much abdominal visceral fat and subcutaneous fat was lost. But judging by what we're seeing in the way of markers, like triglycerides, HDL, et cetera, it's likely preferentially lost from abdominal visceral fat. And when you do these things, there are no side effects. There are side benefits, including in skin. So here's one woman's experience over 90 days. So while she experienced a reduction in waist circumference, increased lean muscle mass, look at her facial features. Not only did she lose the crow's feet around her eyes and a uh, reduction in the smile lines around her mouth, she also started to get a reduction in the nasolabial fold right along the nose and the forehead wrinkles. And look at the color of her skin, that redness and receding. While drugs have to talk about side effects and adverse effects and loss of muscle and pancre pancreatitis and costs, we're accomplishing a very different thing where people are happier, look younger, are stronger, and yet they're also losing abdominal visceral fat and all the wonderful effects. So I think it's time to update our thinking on how to improve, not just get weight loss, right? But improve body composition. So we're gonna do so by trying to specifically target loss of abdominal visceral fat. We're gonna preserve or increase muscle mass and myocyte volume and we get to enjoy age reversing effects so a completely different approach to looking slender and healthy thanks for listening